Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to our weekly webinar of the IFT. Uh, let me just remind you of the usual rules. Uh, you should stay with your microphone off most of the time, unless you want to ask a question. If you want to ask a question, you unmute yourself. You can use the video or not, it's up to you. But uh, if you're not asking a question, please uh, keep the microphone off. You can also use the chat option uh, to write down questions or whatever, and then I can maybe manage them, or even the speaker can see them. And uh, okay, so without further ado, uh, let me just um, uh, welcome uh, our speaker for today, uh, Marcos Garcia Garcia uh, from the IFT. He has been very kind to, uh, to give this webinar uh, entitled Curvature Fluctuations from Disorder During Inflation. So please. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. So, uh, well, of course, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. And uh, thank you all for virtually being here. Uh, right. So uh, it, that's my title. It's probably OK. So it's probably not a very good title, uh, but I try to be descriptive in order not to be misleading about uh, what this talk is going to be about. So, uh, in a nutshell, I will be talking about uh, how stochastic particle production uh, in the early universe can leave imprints in the primordial curvature power spectrum. And uh, most of what I'm, well, all of what I'm going to present uh, is, uh, is the result of the work that I started uh, with Mustafa Amin at the Rice University. Uh, where is the pointer? Lost it. Ah, there. Okay, uh, with Mustafa Amin at, uh, at Rice, yes, uh, where I was a postdoc before uh, coming to IFT, uh, with Dan Green at uh, UC San Diego, and uh, Scott Carlston, who was a student at uh, Rice, and he's now getting a PhD in astronomy at uh, Princeton, I think. Okay. Uh, of course, these are the credited people, but we also have had uh, some... Uh, fruitful, extensive discussions with, uh, with other people, in particular with Daniel Bauman and uh, his student, Hong Sheng Chia, um, who are not formally credited, but uh, you know, we're, we're always uh, uh, helping us a little bit. Um, okay, uh, now I need to make a, a little bit of a warning in the sense that most, if not all of the results that I'm going to be presenting are of the qualitative kind. And uh, this is uh, essentially because the, the time we, we have uh, you know, allocated for talk is limited. That's the only reason why. The details are a little bit gory from the numerical and the uh, analytical points of view. Uh, so if you are interested, you can ask questions. I have some slides at the end, but I, I, I doubt uh, there's going to be much of a point in, in bringing them up. Uh, but everything you want to know about this is in these uh, two papers. So we have Try, we, we've tried to be as detailed as possible with uh, assumptions, approximations, and uh, computations. Okay, so everything you want to know is there. All right, good. Uh, so now uh, let me begin by uh, showing this one slide that I'm borrowing from uh, precisely from Daniel Bauman, uh, which, which contains essentially the, the, the essence of our work. Okay, and uh, let me begin by just reminding you that uh, a big part of the success of the Lambda CDM cosmological model with an early inflationary epoch that provides uh, its initial conditions is the simplicity of it, because we only need a handful really of parameters to uh, fit most of our observations uh, coming from the early universe, in particular from the cosmic microwave background, right? Uh, so However, this simplicity begs uh, the question, which is spelled out uh, here. Uh, does the simplicity of the data really reflect the simplicity of the underlying theory, or uh, does it emerge from complexity? So there are many ways to get from point A to point B. Uh, of course, the simplest one is you know, the straight path uh, along the gentlest slope, but that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, so what we, well, what we want to understand is, is if there is a, a, a sense in which a complex theory can still lead to uh, the simple picture of the early universe that, uh, that we observe. Okay? We, all, we know, uh, by the way, of course, that uh, thermal equilibrium in the, in, 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 you know, um, uh, at some point in the early universe erases, in, in a sense, uh, any complexity about the dynamics, but I'm going to be specifying to uh, inflation. Okay, where you don't have 
uh, uh, equilibrium in that sense. Okay, so now being a little bit more uh, specific, more uh, quantitative, uh, we know that the uh, simple picture of standard single field inflation uh, appears to be in perfect agreement with, uh, with the observations, right? So uh, the curvature power spectrum is uh, nearly scale invariant. We uh, observe, we haven't observed yet any deviation from Gaussianity. And uh, this uh, smallness of the known Gaussianity tells us, uh, suggests that the inflaton interacts very little during inflation. And also, of course, this uh, self-interaction of, well, sorry, the self-interaction of the inflaton is also constrained <coughs> by, uh, by slow roll, right? So again, inflation is simple. You can take the uh, easiest uh, model, well, not the easiest one, but very simple models and still be able to fit uh, the data. Uh, this, though, doesn't tell us much, if anything at all, about the uh, way inflation is embedded into a fundamental uh, particle theory. And uh, here by fundamental, I mean a proper fundamental theory, so not just a you know, patchwork of uh, the standard model plus inflation in a sense, but a theory that tries to address most of the shortcomings of the, uh, of the standard model itself and uh, uh, you know, the, uh, that, we see, that we see from uh, observing the, the cosmos. So uh, you know, dark matter, uh, inflation, of course, baryogenesis, and so on. So this is what I mean by a fundamental theory. theory sorry, and uh, uh, these fundamental theories, these uh, you know ultraviolet completions, tend to be complicated. Complicated in the sense, at least, that the number of degrees of freedom present uh, tends to be very large. So think of think, for example, of supersymmetry, where uh, you know the number of fields, in a sense, is at the very least doubled with respect to those uh, in the standard model, okay? Uh, this uh, large number of fields means that we have a large number of uh, couplings uh, determined by parameters that are essentially unconstrained, okay? Uh, and uh, which can lead to complex interaction potentially that depend on a variety of scales. We, we, we can, we, again, we can have a, some sort of hierarchy. Uh, we have the weak scale, the uh, Susie breaking scale, uh, potentially, I don't know, God scale, string scale, and so on, right? Uh, and of course, they, these theories might be defined in non-trivial field manifolds. All of this is just saying that, uh, oh, sorry, uh, okay, so this, this is the, the uh, what I mean by a, a UV completion. And uh, in the context of inflation, we have very little understanding on how the inflaton couples to these, these uh, other fields, to matter fields, let's say, okay? Uh, we know that the coupling must exist because the universe needs to be reheated after inflation ends, okay? And we have some constraints that depend on certain assumptions uh, uh, regarding, for example, on what the uh, reheating temperature, temperature has to be, uh, but the precise dynamics uh, that uh, that determines this temperature, uh, sorry, the couplings that determine these temperatures and the dynamics during the heating uh, are essentially um, unconstrained, okay, uh, for all intents and purposes. Um, okay, so now uh, emphasizing again this potential complexity, this would suggest in principle that uh, non-trivial dynamics can occur during inflation and uh, during reheating, okay? So if we focus, for example, on the uh, time evolution of a uh, particular degree of freedom that I'm going to be calling chi, uh, then in general, I mean, for a generic theory, one can uh, you know, uh, expect that many particle producing uh, non adiabatic events uh, can happen, uh, sorry, can exist again at, uh, at any time, at, at any epoch, essentially. Uh, these uh, uh, events that uh, generically manifest themselves as time dependent couplings, so this is one example, uh, um, writing an effective time dependent mass for the field chi, uh, which uh, depends uh, on, the, uh, on the instantaneous value of the inflaton field. And in this particular example, depending on what the bare mass is and what this uh, G coupling, uh, what the strength of this coupling is, as the inflaton goes through some special point phi i, which again might be related to the fact that the, uh, you know, the trajectories in field space are non-trivial, um, this effective mass can, uh, can become uh, banishing or even negative for a while. Um, even when, again, in the absence of this coupling, of course, it has to be positive. So 
Uh, some of you might recognize this as uh, one of the ideas behind uh, preheating the exponential enhanced, uh, in, in, sorry, the exponential enhanced production of particles during reheating. But uh, my point is that disorder dynamics can occur essentially at any stage of inflation. So uh, here I'm showing you know, three particular uh, simple, simple in a sense, uh, scenarios in which uh, effective masses and field values uh, vary in a non-periodic, quasi-stochastic manner uh, at, uh, at the very earliest stages of inflation, during inflation, or after inflation. Okay, so these are three examples. These two are coming from a uh, flipped SU5 supersymmetric uh, embedding of inflation, which is close to my heart for obvious reasons. Uh, well, this example in the middle is coming from an axiom monotomy, um, a generic axiom monotomy construction. Okay. Uh, now, uh, these are rather simple in the sense that, okay, you, you see the non-periodicity, but, uh, you know, they don't look particularly uh, stochastic. However, they're potentially more complicated constructions. Uh, I remember one, at least from last week, regarding dark photon production during inflation. There are these constructions called trapped inflation, in which essentially these, uh, uh, these effective masses look like a series of these sort of events. So you would put a sum here, and the phi i's would be essentially random. Uh, there's uh, so-called solid inflation, and so on. So uh, my point is that, again, um, the time dependence of these effective masses can significantly be more complex. Now, uh, owing to this complexity, then, our goal is to not to study the effect of these non adiabatic excitations case by case, but rather we want to see if there is a notion uh, of an emergent uh, limit, think of, think of it as a kind of thermodynamic limit, in which uh, generic conclusions can be reached if the theory is sufficiently, uh, contains a sufficient amount of disorder, okay? One example, and this is essentially what uh, was driving the project at the beginning, um, was this question about the scale invariance of the power spectrum. Okay, so we know that the uh, generic uh, single field inflation model uh, leads to a, a pretty flat power spectrum. Uh, we were wondering, okay, if the flatness of the power spectrum can be recovered purely from uh, stochastically sourced uh, fluctuations, not from the vacuum fluctuation itself, okay? but from particle production. So this is essentially the, the, the kind of uh, idea that was uh, driving the project. And uh, to achieve, uh, to, to be able to, to answer these questions, we are going to be uh, making uh, the following strong, strong assumption, okay? The strong assumption is uh, that we're going to assume that the dynamics of the background are fixed and that they source particle produ production due to time localized interactions, which in turn, uh, you know, source the uh, curvature fluctuation. And uh, this is uh, not only a simplifying assumption, of course, back reaction is always a complicated, uh, uh, you know, thing to account for when you're, when you're solving a particular model. Uh, in our case, given the fact that we're only going to be looking at the lowest possible effect, that is the, the uh, power spectrum of the curvature fluctuation, uh, we know that in the observable window, this, uh, this value, this amplitude of the power spectrum has to be of the order of 10 to minus 9, which is a small number, okay? Uh, and we have checked that if we want to recover that number, then we cannot have any back reaction. So this is a consistent uh, assumption, but anyway, uh, this is what, uh, uh, what we assume. That, uh, uh, the disorder is set by the dynamics of the uh, of the background. All right. Uh, so this is the uh, physical perspective. Now, in order to be able to derive uh, concrete results, we need a mathematical framework. And uh, luckily for us, this framework uh, can be is provided essentially by uh, condensed matter physicists, as usual. Uh, and it comes as in the form of uh, the study of current conduction in materials, right? Uh, now, in this talk, I am going to limit the study to the to a one degree of, to a single degree of freedom, which means that uh, we uh, can map the problem to that of the conduction of current in in a wire, okay, in a one-dimensional wire. All right. In this case, this we have a, a spatial coordinate x. Uh, that essentially measures length along the along the wire. Okay, uh, 
B of x is a potential that is seeded by the impurities present in this wire. These impurities are randomly located uh, along the length of the wire, and of course they uh, lead to random strengths of the potential depending on, on where they are located. Uh, this potential is felt then by the electron wave function, and therefore, in order to just uh, sorry, in, in order to solve the problem, one needs to solve essentially the Schrodinger equation. And as you can imagine, this has been studied for a long time. Uh, the most famous and probably strongest results are coming from the 50s. Okay, uh, this result is known as Anderson localization, and is essentially the statement that. Uh, the electron wave function, this electron wave function is going to develop an exponential localization, a, a spatial exponential localization in the presence of uh, impurities in the wire, regardless of their strength. Okay, so this chi is some, chi, sorry, is uh, some sense of, uh, uh, um, of a measure of the, the amount of disorder that you have in the wire, and this exponential localiza localization always occurs. Or in other words, at zero temperatures, all one-dimensional wires are insulators. That's the, that's the basic statement, okay? Now, uh, uh, for us, this problem of uh, current conduction can be immediately mapped into the problem of particle production simply by identifying space with the time uh, coordinates. So we do some sort of a weak rotation, okay? Uh, so now instead of having space, we have time that's running in the backwards in this picture. Uh, instead of a random potential, we have a random time-dependent effective mass. In this case, it is uh, seeded by these localized uh, non-adiabatic events, uh, particle produ production events, yes. Um, and uh, uh, here then, the exponential localization of the wave function can be mapped as uh, to the exponential growth with time of uh, the uh, of the field in consideration. Okay, so non adiabaticity leads to exponential uh, growth. This is again well known, right? Uh, now, the power of this is then that we can use, uh, we can adapt the mathematical tools that are known from condensed matter physics. And so uh, these come essentially in three different flavors. We can use random matrix theory to try to determine these, uh, these growth rates. Okay, uh, in this picture, one sees this continuous evolution in time as a series of discrete scatterings. Uh, I'll keep calling them scatterings, although they're, again, uh, uh, non adiabatic events, but this series of discrete scatterings in time to which a transfer matrix can be assigned, and therefore you can just uh, multiply them and obtain a solution. Okay, so, and I will say a little bit more on that uh, in, in a couple of slides. Uh, one can also map the, the question in terms of stochastic differential equations. This appears to be a powerful uh, tool, uh, but we haven't been able to, well, not, not been able, sorry, we haven't applied it uh, yet uh, in, in, a very, in a very focused way to, to the problem. Instead, we've gone uh, through the uh, partial differential equation formalism by setting up a focal Planck equation. And I will say a word uh, about this. Okay. Now, uh, okay, so this is now the math mathematical setup. Now, true to the spirit of model independence, we carry out our analysis of the sourcing of the uh, primordial curvature fluctuation, making use, the, uh, making use of the uh, effective field theory of inflation, okay, where we essentially describe inflation in a sense as the spontaneous breaking of time translations. So in this EFT language, this pi here, uh, that notes the quasi Tessiter Goldstone uh, boson, boson mode of the broken time translations, which will be coupled to the expectator field chi. So again, it's a spectator because it doesn't determine the dynamics of the background uh, through the time dependence of the effective mass m. Okay. So uh, to be able to write down this uh, action explicitly, we apply this uh, Stuckelberg trick of replacing the time dependence by the shifted time dependence. Okay, here's pi. And then uh, to solve, we uh, perform a serious expansion to determine the effect of the enhancement to uh, at the lowest order in pi. Okay, so this is an expansion in pi because again, we're after an effect, which is the, the, the amplitude of the power spectrum that is, uh, of the order of 10 to the minus nine, okay? 
So uh, this expansion is in pi. It is not an expansion in the coupling. It's not an expansion in m squared. It is not an expansion in chi. So this chi can perfectly be seeded non-perturbatively. Okay, it can grow exponentially. There's no problem. But we need to keep under control the size of, uh, of the Goldstone pi. Okay. And uh, after doing this expansion, this uh, function c here can be simply identified with a function of these lower row parameters and can be taken to be approximately constant. So it's just a, a particular normalization of, of pi. Okay. Uh, so now we have an action here. We have a chi, which, which is seeded by the disorder containing this effective mass. One can then write down the equations of motions the equations of motion for phi and chi, and given a form of the disorder, you can solve this, okay? Uh, now, uh, given the fact that we want to extract generic uh, conclusions that apply essentially for any, or at least almost any possible form of the disorder, uh, we are forced to, again, to be able to make some uh, specific computations, we are forced to make some simplifying uh, assumptions, okay, which are spelled out explicitly in this, uh, in this uh, slide, okay. Uh, the first uh, simplifying assumption is, well, it's not so much a simplifying assumption, sorry, uh, as, well, it is, but uh, uh, this one is just a particular choice for the value of the bare mass of, uh, of chi, uh, uh, which we have chosen to have this form at least for the results that I'm going to present in this, uh, in these slides, okay, so the, the, this m, this mass, sorry, here, is proportional to the Hubble parameter during inflation multiplied by the square root of two, okay? Now, uh, this choice can be ju is justified in, in, two, in two ways, essentially. Uh, so the first justification is the fact that, again, we have in mind uh, fundamental theories within which we embed inflation, and one can check, uh, that in many of those, uh, essentially any spectator field acquires some, uh, becomes heavy with a mass essentially of the order of the Hubble parameter. This happens all the time in supersymmetric theories. And for those of you that uh, you know, have been played with this, this essentially makes realizing uh, the Affleck time mechanism in, in supersymmetry uh, a, tricky, a, tricky, uh, a tricky thing, uh, a tricky thing to do. Okay, so this, that's one, you know, reasoning of why we, we consider this to be a valid choice. The other, the other uh, reason why we choose it is because it's super simple uh, to work with, at least uh, analytically. And that's because if you write down the equation of motion for uh, the canonically normalized field X, which is uh, just the scale factor times uh, the field chi, uh, one can check that in the absence of interactions in, uh, in the sitter space time, the equation of motion, uh, yeah, the equation of motion for uh, for x describes nothing but uh, plane waves. But instead of being written in terms of cosmic time, they're written in conformal time. So we call this the conformal mass uh, conformal mass choice. Okay. Now we introduce the alpha and beta Bogolubov coefficients to uh, parameterize the deviation from uh, from the vacuum pipe. Okay. So this is a choice born out of simplicity. But of course, this, this is not necessarily uh, necessary at all. In fact, we have solved the problem also for a massless field. And we have been able also to show that the qualitative results essentially don't depend on the value of m. So you can choose anything you want here, uh, module or some constraints. Uh, and, uh, and the results look the same. It's just that this choice makes the, the uh, analytical solution a lot easier. OK. Um, Okay, this second uh, approximation here is uh, corresponds to the effective time dependent mass that is being sourced by uh, non adiabaticity. As I mentioned before, we're assuming that uh, this non adiabaticity, these scatterings are localized. So we take it to its uh, extreme limit and we assume that uh, we can approximate them by uh, some of direct delta functions, direct delta scatterers. Okay, it's the simplest. Uh, uh, possible choice. Again, this allows us to be able to compute things analytically and uh, it makes the numerics a lot simpler. But we have also broken these assumptions. So we have considered wide, fat, let's say, scatters and the results look uh, essentially the same. Okay. So here, uh, this is a direct delta function centered at these random locations Tj with a random, uh, with random strengths Mj. 
which uh, are assumed to be uncorrelated at different times. Uh, sigma here is essentially um, parameterizing the strength, the, the strength of these individual scatterers. Okay. And uh, and what else? And uh, this uh, quantity here uh, will become important in a minute. This curly N S corresponds to the ratio of the mean number of uh, scattering events per uh, by the uh, number of efaults. So this is a number density of scatters scatterings per efault. Okay, and uh, as I mentioned, it will become important uh, in a second. Uh, last, uh, but not least, uh, this, this assumption is related to uh, what I mentioned before about back reaction, uh, although it's not, uh, uh, sorry, then I'm, going, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, okay? This is uh, the, uh, the limit in which, we, in which we work, okay? So we consider the sourcing of pi by chi, but we don't consider the sourcing of chi by pi. That is, we don't take into account dissipation effects in our, uh, in our study. Uh, the reason why this works is a little bit technical. Uh, it's related to the fact that uh, the source, the, the operators that source pi scale with just the correlators of, uh, of chi, whereas this order scales with unequal time commutators and uh, turns out that these commutators grow much more slowly than uh, these correlators, so this order is always a subdominant effect. In fact, and I'm going back to that, in fact, uh, dissipation appears to, become, to, uh, appears to become important uh, only when uh, you're near the, the, when you have to worry about back, about back reaction anyway. So, so we can, um, so we uh, disregard this inverse sourcing, we disregard dissipation, and that means that we can solve simply this bit of the, uh, we can solve simply for this bit of the action for uh, the field chi. Okay, we can write down the equation of motion for it, uh, plug it, let's say, into the computer, uh, solve it numerically, given a form of the disorder, and see what it looks like. Okay, and this is what it looks like for uh, some random generic form of the disorder uh, m, m squared of t. Okay, so you can see here, uh, the many uh, peaks that are randomly located in time. This scale is linear in time. Marco, uh, yeah, yes. can I ask questions? Yes. In the previous slide, the value of the small m, how does it compare with the large m? Uh, the value of the small m uh, here uh, between these two? Yes. Uh, at at uh, this point, we don't assume uh, anything, but uh, it, it, because uh, sorry, um, because essentially we have uh, uh, we have also considered m this big m to be equal to zero. So it can be uh, it can be bigger, it can be smaller. It's uh, the result is generically the same essentially. Okay, and another question is: Do you stop at linear order in pi in the function? Uh, we stop at linear order in pi, yes. So that, that's what I was saying, that uh, this is where we stop. We don't okay. consider any, any high order uh, operators. <clears throat> okay. And, and, but this is, is this guaranteed to be larger than the term pi, partial pi squared? That you uh, get yeah, that, that, that is a very good question. So uh, it is, in general, it's not guaranteed to be uh, bigger than it. it uh, uh, a term here can can dominate over this one, depending essentially on what explicit form of this uh, effective mass is. We we have seen that we have checked it, uh, but uh, the one thing that we have uh, been able to show is that uh, at least if you restrict uh, to um, again to the case where back reaction is not important and to the case when. Uh, 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 cutoffs are, are, are also, uh, sorry, the dynamics don't depend on, on, on arbitrary cutoffs, and I will get uh, to that uh, in a minute. Uh, then this, this term always dominates over, over the other one. It's a little bit technical. Um, so uh, all, I, all, I'm, all I'm going to say is that uh, within the uh, parameter space that we restrict ourselves, this is the dominant term. But uh, you, can, you can also construct a, a, a you know, a scenario in which all of the terms in the expansion are important. So, so, uh, so, so this is what we assume, we solve, we check that the assumption is, makes sense, and then uh, that's our justification. 
Okay, and one last question. Yes. Did uh, Carly NS that you define? Yes. It's supposed to mean that you have the same number of events on average per number of efforts? Yes. But this is not the same as assuming that you have the same number of events per unit of time, right? Uh, the same number of events per unit of time. Uh, no. no, no. So you're, you're, you're assuming some sort of uh, distribution here of how this happened over time. Uh, yes, 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 yes. So uh, it, 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 I mean, uh, technically, and technically, I mean, when we actually do the, the simulations, if you wish, uh, we assume that this uh, distribution is uniform. Uh, but uh, but you can take any other distribution. Okay, I, I actually checked it at some point. You can take uh, uh, some sort of uh, non-localized Gaussian distribution. It all works out the same. But yes, we're assuming there there is this is defined over a distribution in uh, in time. Okay. Okay. But I think uh, can I say something? Yes. I think uh, if I understood correctly, I mean by unit. E fold is, I think, also a unit interval in time in cosmic time during uh, slow roll inflation. Uh, it, it is. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It is. Uh, my, my point was that it also depends on what the uh, what the Hubble parameter is uh, uh, during sure. inflation, right? So it's not exactly set by time itself. Uh, it is more correct to think it's uh, it's in, in units of uh, Hubble time, if you wish, or, or an E fold. Right. Uh, but yes, of course, I mean, if, if you have slow roll inflation, these two are linearly related, so it's one and the same thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So you are, you are only focusing on what happens during inflation, not after? Uh, right now, yes, just inflation. Nothing after it. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, where I was, okay, I was showing the generic features of a solution, right? So this is the one particular form of the, this uh, effective mass, okay? So it has these peaks. Uh, this is going along the answering the question uh, uh, that uh, that was being asked uh, because this scale is linear in time. Okay, uh, it is logarithmic in cost. Uh, sorry, in conformal time here tau because we're uh, we're in inflation. Uh, so this k is the weight number that uh, corresponding to the mode that we are solving for. Okay, again k tau. So uh, at one. This mode crosses the horizon. This, uh, therefore, whatever is to the left corresponds to sub horizon dynamics. Whatever is to the right corresponds to super horizon dynamics. All right. And uh, this blue curve here shows the solution for the natural log of the square of the uh, of the field. Uh, sorry, of the of the magnitude of the of the mode uh, uh, of the mode function of x, of the canonically normalized field. So uh, as expected, of course, if we put in disorder, we obtain a disorder solution out of this, right? But uh, we can see that uh, there are some generic features that can be immediately read off. First one is that inside the horizon, uh, we observe essentially no deviation. Well, we can, I mean, by eye, we have essentially observe no deviation from, uh, from the vacuum. And uh, this is related to the fact that although uh, occupation numbers grow exponentially fast with time uh, inside the horizon. This exponential growth cannot compete with uh, the expansion of the universe with, uh, with inflation, essentially. So it always gets diluted more efficiently. And uh, if you look at the analytical details of this, then uh, one can check that uh, the phases involved in the problem are essentially random uniformly distributed and so uh, there is no sense of uh, bosonic build-up that can help you uh, get a sufficient amount of, uh, of, of particle production. Okay, Now this ceases to be true as soon as you get near or uh, outside the horizon Okay, where uh, this solution is depicting essentially an exponential growth here with time. It is disordered but it's exponentially uh, growing. And this is now related to the fact that uh, outside the horizon, particle produ production becomes uh, much more efficient. Uh, phases cease to be uniformly distributed. They become localized, although it's still randomly but localized uh, uh, about, uh, uh, about some value. And then the bosonic buildup becomes much more, uh, much more efficient. Okay, so uh, 
essentially barely any particle production here, a lot of particle production there, we have exponential growth, right? Now, I mentioned this is a numerical solution. Uh, this solution is aided by the fact that we chose, uh, again, uh, direct delta scatterers because we can see them as uh, instantaneous events to which uh, transfer matrix can be assigned, right? So these MJ at the, at the sorry, this M at the J location that uh, evolves the volume of coefficients from the left to the right by uh, multiplication. Okay, so this M depends on the local uh, value of the disorder here. Uh, and we can do this exercise side by side. So in the computer, just multiply matrices. Uh, oops, uh, okay. And by chaining J of them together, uh, you can obtain the total transfer matrix that takes you from uh, the initial condition to any later point uh, in time, okay? Uh, this multiplicative property is very important, as I will comment uh, in a minute, uh, and, and allows us to, to have analytical control over the computation, all right? Uh, now, this is not very important, but let me just mention it, uh, at least not very important for the, for the talk. Uh, this total MJ, this total transfer matrix, can be parameterized in terms of two angles and one uh, a real positive parameter N, which is what we define to be the occupation number even outside the horizon. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what we mean by, by that N. Uh, uh, of course, this field magnitude can be written as a function of these three quantities. Okay, now this is one solution. But uh, in principle, we don't know what form the disorder has. So I can take a different possible realization, which is shown here, and out of it, I will obtain a different form of the solution. It still sh shares the same features. So essentially no growth and exponential growth, uh, but the, uh, the particular values are different. I can repeat the exercise uh, for, a, uh, for a second time and for a different form of the disorder, I obtain a different form of the solution. And so on, okay, I can, repeat the, I can repeat doing this until I populate an ensemble of disorder realizations. Okay, this is not an ensemble of uh, disorder. And out of it, I can populate an ensemble of uh, solutions for uh, the dynamics, okay? Now, the best way to go turns out to be to actually populate an ensemble of, of possible total transfer matrices because the proper, the, sorry, the multiplicative property that they have uh, implies that the evolution is uh, Markovian, okay? And uh, probability density that is defined over the, uh, the space, oh, sorry, over this ensemble of transfer matrices will satisfy a relatively simple uh, uh, evolution equation. Here it's written uh, in uh, some sort of a symbolic manner, okay? This, this is one, uh, this is none other than the, uh, well-known Smolachowski or uh, mathematicians call it the uh, chapman kolmogorov equation, okay, for P. It describes, again, a Markovian process. Uh, and uh, in particular, if you uh, expand with respect to a small time, time step, uh, one can write it as a Fokker-Planck equation for P, okay? But it, this is a P of M, of the transfer matrices. And so if you want to... Uh, uh, compute the probability density of any other quantity, all you have to do is take a projection, let's say. So out of this P, I can then uh, compute the distribution function for uh, this variable, the log of x squared in particular, okay, which I'm showing here, right? So uh, this is the problem that we have been uh, studying analytically and numerically. Uh, it is not trivial. I am not going to go into the details, so I'm just going to show what, uh, what we have found, what the results are. And they boil down essentially to four properties that are very important. The first property is this one, okay? Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that we're wondering about a, a potential emergent limit. It turns out that this limit does exist, okay? And this is the limit of many scatterings per e-fold, right? So if this curl ENS is much bigger than one, then we have been able to show again, both numerically and analytically that the study of the statistical evolution of this ensemble uh, depends only on one parameter, one single parameter, which is uh, this one. I am going to be calling it the scattering parameter. It is this product of the density of uh, scatterings times the square of the ratio of the uh, 
um, mean strength of the disorder uh, at one location divided by uh, the Hubble parameter, right? So you can have a uh, you know, very weak disorder, but still, if you have a lot of it, you see the same effect of having a stronger disorder, but not as much uh, of it, okay? So this is this is a a very strong result again. Now the, now all the all the evolution of the ensemble depends on a single parameter. Uh, second result is this one, which is also rather non-trivial. We have found that uh, this probability density for the log of x squared is a a Gaussian. It is normally distributed at all times. So be it inside, at, or uh, far outside the horizon, it is always a Gaussian. It's time dependent, time dependence changes when you go from uh, sub horizon to super horizon uh, evolution, but it's always distributed like this. Okay, so this is, this is uh, crucial. Uh, third result the mean of the log grows linearly with time outside the horizon uh, with a rate that depends non linearly on this uh, scattering parameter. All right, and uh, the last. Uh, but not least important property uh, is essentially the fact that the variance also grows linearly with time outside the horizon uh, with a rate again that is a nonlinear function of this scattering parameter. This plot and this equation here are actually a more sophisticated statement. So it's just saying that this two point correlation function for the driftless variable uh, grows linearly outside the horizon, but then it tapers off uh, this, uh, because growth at later times is uncorrelated with growth at earlier times. Uh, okay, uh, and now if you add these four uh, results, these four properties, one can check then, uh, well, it is known that uh, this implies that uh, this logarithmic variable, this log of x squared, performs an honest to God, a mathematical uh, bona fide Brownian random walk outside the horizon uh, as a function of cosmic time. Or in other words, that this x squared, this magnitude of the field squared, performs a geometric uh, brown and random walk outside the horizon. And uh, uh, again, this realization means that we at least have some sort of analytical control over uh, the computation of any possible correlator that we, that we want to construct. If we want to calculate, for example, this endpoint correlation function for the uh, field magnitude squares over n possible uh, times, all we all we need to do, all we need to know, sorry, it's uh, are these two uh, are these two ensemble averages, okay? But these are over the logarithmic variable, uh, and that's why there is an exponential outside here. Okay, so this is the essentially main feature of this geometric uh, random uh, random walk, all right? And uh, with this at hand, we can now go back and attempt to solve for the evolution of, uh, of pi, of the curvature slope duration. So uh, we have analytical control. We can now, uh, again, go back to the equation of motion for pi. Uh, during inflation, this pi is uh, essentially just linear, uh, is related to the curvature fluctuation by this constant, the Hubble parameter, okay? Uh, we can write down explicitly the equation of motion that is satisfied by pi. Here's the uh, stochastic sourcing coming through chi and coming through m. Uh, the equation can be solved in terms of uh, Green's functions. Uh, formally, we can compute then the two-point correlation function for the solution, write it for the curvature power spectrum, take out this cubic uh, piece, and then derive the form of the uh, component of the power spectrum that is stochastically sourced uh, by, the, by this disorder. And we're calling it delta of delta so here. Okay, so this is the uh, stochastic component of the power spectrum. And uh, this is its general form, okay? Uh, now, for any form of the disorder, there are two things that need to be uh, uh, emphasized. The first one is the fact that this stochastic uh, component uh, comes multiplied by two powers of the uh, component of the power spectrum source by the vacuum fluctuation, which means that uh, if we assume this vacuum fluctuation is again of the order of 10 to minus 9, we, one, uh, the, uh, the stochastic sourcing needs to overcome uh, 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 suppression uh, of nine orders of magnitude, okay? Uh, that which immediately tells us that if the if disorder is weak, then you don't see it in the power spectrum. 
it's, uh, it's as simple as that, okay? Uh, the other thing here is this little AS is the regularization scheme that we have used. This is for all intents and purposes one loop calculation. Uh, we have used arithmetic subtraction, um, which means that uh, to any source operator you subtract its uh, vacuum value, and so in the absence of disorder, this whole contribution just uh, vanishes. All right. Now uh, the you know careful uh, observer will compare complain because uh, you know uh, the, this uh, power spectrum is not only sourced by the excited X but also by the uh, effective mass itself. I mentioned that we were assuming it to be direct delta functions and now here there are derivatives and this becomes a little bit of an issue because uh, a non-physical non-physical um, non-physical divergences essentially show up right uh, we cannot take these derivatives it is related to the fact that for an infinite, infinitely uh, uh, narrow scatter, the corresponding resonance band is essentially infinitely wide. So you are exciting any wavelength, even the smallest ones. Uh, and in order to cure this, uh, this issue, we, one can uh, widen the direct delta function and that allows one to realize that uh, this finite width of the scatter, uh, oops, called the W here, uh, is equivalent to introducing this uh, cutoff lambda that depends that depends on time. Okay, so this renders the computation uh, finite uh, for any value of the uh, of, of the disorder. Uh, it turns out that if, if you're in the regime where disorder wins over the suppression, this uh, cutoff dependence is essentially negligible. So disorder is more important than the cutoff, and this means that our results can be seen uh, in uh, as as generic in a sense. Okay, last but not least is the fact that one also needs to be careful about the duration of, uh, of this non adiabatic epoch because uh, if you assume that uh, you, this, this stochastic sourcing occurs from uh, the infinite past, then you will end up with an infinite amount of sourcing. And so one needs to think then that uh, this scattering started and ended at a finite uh, times. Uh, to the beginning of scatterings, we assign, uh, we, we identify this uh, scale K0, which is the scale that crosses the horizon at the beginning. Uh, the scale that crosses the horizon uh, at the end is KF. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I'll just say that uh, this is the general form to solve for uh, the expectation value. We can, oops, we can put just uh, brackets here, uh, brackets here make use of this uh, fantastic formula and then write down an analytical solution. I'm not writing it down explicitly because it's complicated. It would span the whole page, uh, but it can be you know, written in a schematic form in this way. So uh, this is the arithmetic mean of this uh, source, uh, source power spectrum. Here's the quadratic suppression uh, com with the, coming from the vacuum fluctuation. It is linearly uh, dependent on this uh, on this scattering parameter, but it's also exponentially sensitive to it. Uh, it is exponentially sensitive to the number of infalls, and it turns out to be not scale invariant in general. Okay, here's a plot of the results for the for this uh, for this mean. Okay, for the analytical results, uh, this band corresponds to uh, about 20 infalls of disorder. Okay, so. Uh, all the uh, scales that are to the left of the band were always super horizon doing scatterings. All scales within the band across the horizon doing scatterings. And scales to the right of the band were always sub horizon doing scatterings. Okay? This is the relative enhancement. And I'm plotting for three order one values of uh, NS sigma squared. All right? Uh, so from here, uh, generic results can also be uh, read in a very similar way that I did before for the spectator field. Uh, first generic result is the fact that if you are below one, if you are below detectability, the power spectrum turns out to be generically scale invariant, okay? Which, are, which is good and bad news. It's good news because again, uh, what we were uh, hoping in a sense what, was that we could source a scale invariant power spectrum only coming from disorder. And it turns out that that, that actually happens, okay? So this one is purely sourced from disorder and it's scale invariant. Problem is that uh, when it's scale invariant, it's subdominant to the vacuum fluctuation, so you don't see it, okay? 
when uh, the, the uh, source power spectrum becomes dominant, then it has a very non-scale invariant shape. It, it has a, 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 a red tilt, okay? And it can be understood very simply by uh, looking at the time evolution of the, of the modes, okay? Uh, for example, for the super horizon modes, we know that as soon as scatterings begin, they start growing exponentially fast, okay? But since they're already super horizon, no meaningful correlations can, uh, can be established between these modes. And so the, uh, uh, this two-point correlation function is essentially that of a, uh, of a white noise process, okay? And so the power spectrum just scales as the cube of K, right? For the modes in the band, uh, something similar happens, right? The modes to the left have more time to grow than the modes to the right, and so the tilt appears. Uh, more specifically, there is this exponential sensitivity to the to the efforts of growth given uh, a, a value of k. This gamma is a function of the uh, of the scattering parameter. It is essentially zero if it is less than one, which is why we see these uh, scale invariants. And so, uh, you know, writing explicitly the, the, this uh, number of e-folds in terms of k and n, one sees the exponential sensitivity to n and the lack of scale invariance. Uh, finally, uh, for the modes that are always sub-horizon, uh, there's always a component that is very close to the vacuum. The sourcing is subdominant uh, always to the, to the vacuum fluctuation, and there the results actually depend on the cutoff on this uh, width. So uh, I would finish here uh, because now this is a very these are very nice results. But now the problem now is that we, we only have control over this uh, arithmetic mean, and uh, it turns out this is an empirical fact that has, uh, as far as I know, was realized first by the people that play with our money in the stock market. Uh, the fact that if you add a series of log normally distributed random variables, uh, that is, if you integrate uh, chi. Uh, you generically tend to obtain, and th there is no theorem for this, you generically tend to obtain a random variable that is skew log normally uh, distributed. Log normal random variables have fat tails, their distributions have fat tails. A skew log normal random variable has an even fatter tail. And this would imply that this uh, expecta expectation value will in general be a poor descriptor of what the typical member of the ensemble uh, looks like. Now, let me illustrate that uh, showing uh, a few numerical solutions for the equations uh, of motion. So here's one solution. Uh, the weight of the band is the same, 20 e folds, but now instead of taking n sigma square of order one, I'm making it as big as 25. And as you can see, the generic uh, shape that I mentioned before is still here. You have the cubic growth, you have roughly scale invariant because we're below one, and you have a cut of dependence all the way to the right. But now, uh, you know, the, 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 the issue is that I went all the way to 25 and I, I'm still below one. Whereas here, if I go, you know, bigger than two, essentially I, I'm supposed to be all the way up here. Uh, well, this is not inconsistent with anything because if I take a different realization of the disorder, I will obtain something that looks like this, okay? So I have the same features, cubic scaling, less scale invariance because we are now uh, at around one. Some features here have arised. Some of these peaks are numerical, but uh, these features are very real. Okay, if I take a third realization, I see now that it, this one looks like this, okay? So it's now eight orders of magnitude bigger than the first one, although the parameters that I'm using are exactly the same. This one, of course, is not scale invariant at all, and the features are much bigger. And I can continue populating the ensemble, okay? I can't do many of these uh, in practice because it takes a lot of time uh, from the computer. And uh, I, can, I can get, uh, sorry, uh, and uh, I obtain this summary plot that I'm showing here, okay? So you can see this ensemble of uh, power spectra are spanning about 12 orders of magnitude uh, in magnitude. And that means, of course, that the arithmetic mean will be, uh, I mean, this makes obvious that the arithmetic mean is a very poor descriptor of what a typical member of the ensemble looks like. If I add 10 to the minus four to 10 to the four, I obtain 10 to the four. So this arithmetic mean is just telling me how big the power spectrum can be, okay? 
here's the uh, analytical solution. So it's uh, essentially a rather poor uh, upper bound on what the, on what the ensemble of power spectra look like. Uh, the geometric mean is a better estimator of what the typical power spectrum looks like, but uh, unfortunately we don't know how to compute that in a general form. Whereas Q log normal random variable, there is no general formula, let's say, for, for these geometric means, for a geometric random one. Uh, the best we can do for now is to uh, construct a lower bound, which is coming from suppressing correlations in the two-point correlation function. Okay, And uh, this is essentially the amount of control that we have over the, uh, over the magnitude of the power spectrum. Uh, this is an alternative summary plot, okay, where, uh, which is now in 3D. Uh, so here this plane shows the same plot, uh, the weight number dependence of the log of the, of the ratio of the source and on-source power spectra. This uh, plane here shows the growth with time or defaults of the individual power spectra. Here they're close to each other because we're still inside the horizon. Then uh, they cross the horizon and start fanning out, spanning many orders of magnitude. And most crucially, this uh, panel here depicts the form of the probability density for the logarithmic variable, uh, which as you can see, again, is not symmetric and it has a fat tail, okay? And this is for the log, this is not even for the linear variable. So if I compute the mean here, I will not get the value near the peak, but rather I will get a value somewhere uh, up there, okay? The, the tail weighs a lot more than this, uh, than this peak. Now, uh, let, me, oof, uh, let me spend a negative three minutes uh, to discuss very briefly the observational implications of these, uh, of these results. And uh, to be able to discuss them, the first thing that one needs to address is this freedom that we have in the duration of the, of the non-adiabatic uh, period, of the non-adiabatic epoch, okay? I mentioned at the beginning that we can have this uh, sourcing happen very early during inflation, uh, somewhere during inflation, or uh, at near the end of inflation, okay? Uh, this first case corresponds to having the sourcing happening too early during inflation, so early that uh, this band essentially does not overlap with the CMB band, so this case star is the Planck pivot scale, and this depicts a few decades in, in K where we can make uh, direct uh, measurements, okay? So if this is the case, then uh, this sourcing of the power spectrum is essentially invisible to us, okay? At least at the lowest order. Uh, now, of course, you know, uh, you could potentially detect it through uh, higher order um, effects. Uh, this, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this stochasticity can potentially bias our background due to uh, mode-mode couplings, or it uh, could potentially show up in higher point correlation functions. But at least at the lowest order, we don't see anything. Uh, something similar happens if the uh, stochasticity occurs very late during inflation. It might even be tied to the end of inflation and the eventual uh, beginning of reheating. Okay. And depending on the, how, how close this happens to the end of inflation, again, it might be invisible through direct observations of the CMB, uh, sorry, to direct measurements of the, uh, of the power spectra, but it might show up uh, uh, you know, uh, through uh, CMB spectral distortions, or it can potentially source the production of primordial uh, black holes. Now, uh, the most interesting case is, of course, that in which these two bands overlap with each other. Here now, one needs to remember that there is, uh, that what uh, would be detectable is not the vacuum fluctuation nor the stochastic fluctuation, but the sum of both. And so uh, that means one has essentially three different possibilities as well, okay? These three uh, plots, by the way, are constructed from uh, these three realizations, just uh, without the numerical noise uh, on them, okay? So they're the same thing. Uh, and uh, this now shows explicitly the Planck band. Uh, this is the, 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 sorry, the red and orange or pink, whatever this color is, uh, contours correspond to the one and two sigma uh, reconstruction of the power spectrum by Planck. Okay, so the pivot scale is somewhere here, I think. And uh, this first panel corresponds to the scenario in which uh, given a, an ensemble, uh, this one corresponds to, again, the same 25 uh, for the disorder strength, 
uh, the uh, stochastically sourced component is subdominant to the vacuum one. And that will mean that we essentially see nothing but uh, you know, the, the, the ordinary uh, single field inflation, if you want. Uh, th here's a small bump, but it's hidden at, uh, at low scales, small scales, sorry. This panel in the middle is much more interesting because here both the vacuum fluctuation and the stochastic fluctuation are comparable to it each other in the Planck uh, window, you can see here that uh, features appear to be suppressed, you know, in the crucial regime, but, uh, you know, there are peaks hidden just outside the observational window, again, uh, leading to potentially interesting phenomenological uh, uh, implications. Think, again, primordial uh, black hole formation. Uh, finally, if the stochastic uh, sourcing is too strong, of course, uh, the power spectrum is too noisy and is already ruled out. So I'll, I'll stop here. Let me just uh, try to summarize uh, a little bit what we did, what we are finding and what needs to be done. So uh, again, uh, all this uh, study is driven out of the, uh, of questioning how, um, how the simplicity of the uh, early universe data depends on the simplicity of the theory, okay? What we have shown is that if you have a sufficient amount of disorder in your theory, there exists a limit in which a generic statistical, uh, um, statistical uh, a generic statistical description can be can be obtained, can be derived. Now, in the case of inflation, it tells us that if your disorder is not non-perturbatively large, so here again, all the particle production is non-perturbative. I'm referring to non-perturbative in terms of this uh, stochastic parameter and sigma square. So if this emergent parameter is of order one or less, the disorder won't show up in, in the data. If it is large, let's say of order 50 or bigger, it is always ruled out and there exists a window in which it can potentially be, uh, uh, you know, lead to interesting, uh, interesting uh, uh, phenomena, okay? Uh, so here's my conclusions, same thing. Uh, the only thing is that, again, we haven't looked at the endpoint correlation functions yet. Uh, this formalism can be potentially interesting to, uh, for computing uh, the uh, stochastic gravitational uh, wave background, for instance. Uh, we have yet to describe a generic stochastic picture for preheating. And uh, as I mentioned before, if you're not in the back reaction regime, there's no need to worry about dissipation and vice versa. All right, sorry for taking so long, thank you. Thank you, Marcos, for this very nice talk. So we have no uh, time for questions. Remember that you have to unmute yourself in order to ask the question. No questions? Okay, I will make one question. Yes. Uh, so if you're a model builder, uh, does this stochasticity help you or not? For example, in making models which can be can be working with epsilon slow roll parameter, which is uh, larger or something like that. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by helping you. Well, normally you you go through a lot of pain to make the potential flat enough and things like that. Yes. Uh, so well, okay. So here, I would guess the the answer might be yes and no, depending on on uh, on what one has in mind. So again, uh, the generic. Uh, uh, results that we obtained here uh, assume that, for example, that the background was fixed. So in a sense, all this pain about constructing the sufficiently flat potential uh, is going to still be there. Uh, maybe, you know, one, one can also make you know, potentially more complicated construction. So this idea of trapped inflation is essentially to, be, to, to try to check if uh, through particle production you can mimic uh, the friction of uh, of the for the for the slow roll of the inflaton field, so you could have a very you know um, uh, a non-flat potential for the inflaton, and then uh, slow it down through particle production. Uh, so this this uh, has been studied. Uh, 
in our case, we cannot really reach our, that limit with, uh, with the tools that we have available. So that's why I was saying uh, we haven't uh, gone uh, all the way into the back reaction regime. Here, the most we can say is that if, you're, if you can construct this, uh, uh, sorry, if you can get an inflationary epoch out of your model, then how important is, uh, are the complex dynamics of the non-inflaton fields uh, for, the, for, uh, for observables, for sourcing the power spectrum. And so the, the generic answer is that as, as long as they're not too, the, the model is not too disordered by, me, uh, you know, where not too disorder is measured in terms of this uh, emergent parameter, uh, then you're safe, okay? You, you, don't need to, you, you don't need to worry about this. If you have inflation, you have inflation and that's it. Um, or, you know, again, depending on how complex your theory is, you can potentially put some constraints on how much you expect to get uh, for, uh, uh, for features in the power spectrum and so on. So, uh, but it's, it's not as powerful as, as it might seem at, at first sight, just because of that fact that at least here in our, in our uh, setup, we're still assuming that the background dynamics are fixed somehow. Okay, so you, you still need to put in uh, uh, the, the, the slow roll inflation by, by hand, if, if that makes sense. Also, the randomness that you consider is homogeneous. It's only mm -hmm. in time, the, the jumps are not the same. coupling, say, the mass. Uh, right, you're right. So, so we are just it's assuming... A, we need a standard vacuum fluctuations to, as, as seeds anyway. But not just uh, yes. in, in homogeneity, it's just by randomness. Mm -hmm. Yes. I guess that's that's why you get the answer, which is proportional to the vacuum. Uh, yeah. I would say yes, but I think I need to think about it a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Yes. Okay. Are there more questions for Marcos? Yes. Okay, Guillermo, go ahead. Um, so, in the case in which the the phase of uh, non-stochastic non fluctuations happens when, let's say, you can see through the CMB, okay, mm -hmm. which was one of the slides you had. Is it possible to make a, an order of magnitude estimate of how large can this uh, combination n c divided by h square? using that uh, this extra contribution that you get to the power spectrum is like a non-gaussianity? Uh, oh, you're wondering about non-gaussianity? Well, I mean, you have two, two parts, no, to the primordial power spectrum. Right. The usual one, that yes. it had a zero subscript, and then there was this delta mm. square, no? Yes. And then you're saying that if you make the combination of n times c divided by h squared sufficiently large, then you're making this thing in some realizations grow, right? Yeah, yes, yes, okay. So I would say that uh, just by using that uh, Planck puts a limit uh, on FNL of a certain number, you could uh, estimate how large this uh, parameter can be. Yes, 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 yes. No, that, that, that is a great question. Uh, we haven't gotten to that. Uh, to that yet. So I, I, I have to mention that uh, there was a significant amount of pain involved in driving <laughs> all of these, uh, yes, all of these uh, numerical and analytical results. So, so far we have only been able to get to, uh, to the, you know, the two point correlation function uh, okay. for the bi spectrum and so on. Um, I could, we could wave hands in a bit, but we have uh, uh, notice that our hand waving is not as accurate as we wish it was. So uh, <laughs> I, I don't dare to make a, an order of, order of magnitude estimate for it. So uh, certainly, yes, this would be a very um, uh, important uh, um, thing to do. Okay, because again, you, know, you have constraints on the uh, non-Gaussianity. Just we just haven't gotten there yet. That's that's as much as I can say. Okay, but do you think it could be? It, it could be important. Yes, yes, yeah. for sure. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, it could be as important as to say, well, you you cannot have uh, effects on the power spectrum because otherwise you will be ruled out by non Gaussian. I, I would, yeah. So my first inst instinct would be to say yes, uh, but again, 
Mm -hmm. this, this thing tends to be against your your instance. So, um, so I, I'll just leave it as a conjecture. So I would say, yes, this can be as important or perhaps even more important than just looking at the power spectrum itself. Um, but I, I don't have a, a, a sense to, to you know, how to, how to estimate it. Okay. And another question, if I can, Pepe? Sure. It's quickly. Uh, so perhaps you explain it and I didn't get it. You said that you're neglecting the back reaction of chi into pi, right? Uh, of chi into the background. So we, yes, we sorry, are the background, yeah. Yes. So so we are we are considering the uh, the sourcing of a pi by chi. Okay. But we're uh, not considering the sourcing of uh, chi by pi. So no dissipation effects here. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I said the opposite actually. Yeah. And uh, is it, uh, is it uh, I mean, is this consistent if you have such uh, large effects in some cases? Uh, so we, what we have done is we have checked it uh, in a, some sort of a, a qualitative way uh, with our numerics and so on. It appears to be consistent, yes. Uh, and, and it's uh, it, again, it's related to the fact that uh, what we have found is that uh, this uh, sourcing of the power spectrum grows with time more rapidly that, than the than any dissipation effects. So, uh, but this is just uh, you know, in a sense, empirical from just solving numerically these uh, these equations. We have a little bit of a analytical understanding, but. It, Again, I don't dare to say that we have made sure that this is actually 100% true all the time correct statement. So we are fairly confident that that is the case as just as long as you don't break the, uh, uh, the perturbativity, perturbativity in the sense of the magnitude of power spectrum. So if your power spectrum is always less than one, uh, then you should be, you should, you should be safe. So. So it, it's again in this uh, CMB window is order ten to minus nine. Here's a peak, but this peak is not uh, super high. So so we're still we're still fine. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, more questions. I think. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, can I? Uh, I think I just had a comment. I think because of. I guess I've spoken to Guillermo about this as well at some point. Uh, I think it would be interesting to take the nice uh, distributions that Marcos was showing um, and make a probability distribution out of it as he was showing and try to connect that to a probability distribution on some other observable. For example, uh, CMB spectral distortions uh, or any other observable that one might be interested in. So take the probability distribution on the power spectra that you can generate from this and try to convert it into a probability distribution on some observables such as the level of the CMB uh, spectral distortions or probably your primordial black hole production. I think that would be another interesting observable that we haven't computed. And going from the power spectrum to actually, uh, because the power spectrum at least at high momentum here can't be directly observed, we'll observe them through some other effect uh, not directly in the CMB, obviously, and it'd be interesting to to go there. Maybe Marcos talked about it earlier. Sorry, I missed the first part of the talk. Uh, no, no, no. So that would be a yeah. thank you. Would be what we're going for. Okay. All right. So if there are no more questions, uh, let me thank uh, Marcos uh, in the name of everybody. I think uh, we can put the claps here. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I just want to tell you that uh, this has been recorded, so it will appear in the IFT YouTube channel, IFT webinars uh, anytime. And stay tuned for next week. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Right. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.